We are live on Facebook. So it's not just the good news that you're getting free legal advice. We are also broadcasting to the World Wide Web right now. This is the Tuesday edition of the Not Your Average Investor Show. I'm your host, Pablo Gonzalez. With me as always, the gracious champion. That's why they call him GC, Greg Cohen. Say hello, Greg. Man, you, your, uh, your use of my initials is getting better and better. I'm, I think next week it's, it's going to have to even, I mean, you're going to have to figure out a third rendition of GC. I, I like gracious champion. I'll take that one. Next week. Try Thursday, bro. It's, it's happening from here on out. <laughs> <There's> wow. <laughs> <laughs> Greg's going to need one of those hats with like the Tom Brady TB. It just says GC. <laughs> if you guys knew, if everybody knew here, the thoughts and the plans that Pablo has for me, I just heard in our marketing meeting, I can't spill the beans, but <laughs> this guy is on a rampage to, to make me feel uncomfortable and put me out there. So uh, stay tuned for some pretty, um, we'll say interesting things coming your way from, from the mind of Pablo Gonzalez. Yeah, we got some interesting. Listen, spoiler alert. I want to turn Greg into the Richard Branson of real estate investing, but that's not what we're here to talk about today. We have a very special guest today that we've had a little sneak preview in already. He is a trained violinist. He's the king of probate law of Jacksonville. He is also an amazing internet personality all on its own. Better call Al, probate lawyer extraordinaire, Al Nicoletti. Say hello, Al. Wow. Hey, everybody. So happy to be here with Greg and Pablo. Um, and I can't wait to share my experiences and knowledge and be able just to talk with Greg and Pablo and have open discussions about all this inherited stuff, common mistakes, all of it. So wonderful. Um, join in, ask questions. Uh, you prompted me perfectly, Al, because you're a, you're a pro and you've actually watched the show. So it makes a lot of sense. I do a little bit of housekeeping. So for those of you that have been here before, this may not apply to Bill Shields, Aaron O'Neill, Guillermo Montes, Jake Hargrove, John O'Claggy, Lee Bishop, Leo F., Mike Foster, our regulars that join us on Tuesdays that we really, really appreciate. I didn't get all the way down, right? But Vinay, welcome, Zach. Good to have you here too. But everybody that's new here on the call today, we, this is an interactive show. We want you to participate. We're going to, you know, again, John asked here, what, what was the free legal advice? John, you're a young man. You don't realize that guys like Al generally charge like 400 bucks an hour to spend a little bit of time with him. And uh, we get him here for free. Uh, is that right? Is that your billable rate, Al? Is it way more than that? Oh, actually, it's a little less than that, but we'll get okay. there one day. But you know, <laughs> we've heard of stories of lawyers that will just talk to people. And all of a sudden, in the mail, they get an invoice for like $1,800. And that's the bad reputation that lawyers have just created, whether in Florida or any other states. And I'm not here to do that. You're not getting a Clio invoice. So we're all good today. Awesome. Awesome. So, you know, like they say, never talk weather with your lawyer. But so I, I, I went off on this. I went off on this diatribe here to tell you all that I want you to participate in this discussion. There's two ways of doing that. Number one is the chat box. And if you open that chat box, then I need you to do one quick thing. There is a blue button drop down menu that says all panelists drop that down from all panelists to all panelists and attendees. That way, when you're chatting with us, everybody else sees it and they can answer your questions too while we're you know, in the middle of our discussions and you can make a new friend and you can meet people. And then also, if you really, really want your question asked live, the best thing you can do is to hit on the bottom right, there's a Q&A button where it pops up another box. That is the easiest place for me to keep track of the questions that I need to bring on air because uh, I got a lot of things going on. There's two very intelligent people talking to me and other people talking to me in the chat. I want to I wanna get your question on air. There's also a Facebook group that I'm loosely monitoring as well, but I encourage you if you're on the Facebook group, join us on the Zoom. It's the more interactive version of this. Um, and finally, if you like what you're hearing, you're interested in rental income properties, the next logical step is you just go to jwbwebclass.com. You get a masterclass from Greg Cohen that is on its last legs. We are re-engineering this masterclass. So if you want to catch the vintage edition before it goes vintage, you want to catch that now and you also download the free investor toolkit. So jwbwebclass.com. I'll put it here in the chat once we start talking. And without further ado, Al, I am pumped to have you on here, buddy. I think you and I have been speaking about this for, for a couple of months, and I'm glad it's happening. And I just want to start kind of tell, tell our friends here on the call, just like your, you know, who you are, your experience with real estate. Give us like a little bit of origin story of the Al Nicoletti. Well, let me first say, whenever I do get on stage, Pablo, you're going to be opening it up right? You're, you are incredible at opening up the segments. You just, you lighten up the room, you get everybody pumped and ready. And so again, love being here with you and Greg. 
Um, my name's Alan Nicoletti. I'm an attorney here in Jacksonville Beach. I do all the probate stuff. I do all the quiet title stuff. Um, I started out a lot of my practice in the foreclosure defense growing up in Miami and uh, got a great job offer, came up here to Jacksonville. I brought a huge niche of all that probate, trust administration, the quiet title, the really unique uh, uh, real estate litigation. And it's just taken off, right? Like it's just completely taken off. Um, I went from a whole career in, not I wouldn't say career, but just music in school, just like the school training of music and just really morphed into the area of law. So going from, I don't know if that uh, left brain, right brain thinking, but I really went into uh, law just using my personality and, and knowing that I could, what I could do and share. And I think a lot of my marketing and stuff came from that. Actually, I think being on stage, stage presence, um, you know, getting all the nerves out and really just focusing on being uh, a show. And so I brought all the talents here and I'm ready to roll and keep rolling. And we've talked about this and I love it so much. Cool, man. Cool. Yeah, listen, now, you and I have that kinship that we both moved to Jacksonville two years ago from Miami, found an amazing open community, a thriving business ecosystem of real estate and, and, and you know, feel very, very fortunate that, uh, that we get to share in that experience, man. So let's, let's get right to it, Al. Your, your, your expertise is probate, right? And, right. And, and you bring a lot of value in that arena. Um, as someone who, uh, I have a lot of friends that don't know what probate really is when it comes to real estate. So if you could explain it to my friends, uh, that would really help me tell my friends later. Okay. I'll make sure I explain it right. So if you would ask me this question two years ago, it would have been this long jumbled answer. And eventually we get to the point of it, it went to the heirs, title insurance, but I've really broke it down to somebody died. They owned real estate and all we're doing is moving title to the heirs. The end. That's all we're doing. We're not doing some magical wand performance and trying to do, jump through all these hoops. We're really just transferring title. And the reason we have to do it, it's not just we want to do it. We're told to do it because title insurance is the thing that we're beholden to. I mean, they tell us what they need. And now when we go to court, we're basically like title insurance needs it. So it's really just a process that just has to happen. So title insurance feels comfortable to write a buyer's policy. That's it. Okay, that makes a lot of sense, so, man. Yeah, go ahead, Greg. So, well, so um, for, our, for our guests that are here, right? This, this topic of probate could go a million different ways and it's really powerful and insightful to understand depending on which end of, of the real estate spectrum you are, right? So let's take it from the spectrum from most of our listeners here, right? These are individuals who own rental properties, might own three, five, 10 rental properties, might own them in multiple markets, um, might be at different stages of their career. So might be ramping up, so might be slowing down and getting closer to retirement. Um, what's, what's the most important thing? How can we connect what probate is to somebody who's listening here and, and how should they kind of view probate um, as a way to protect their legacy, protect their assets, save on un unnecessary costs? Um, what are some good things to know there? So I think where we're kind of going is like the different functions of trying to avoid your family and children or heirs that you pick into trust will, whatever you do, to avoid going through this court process to save money and fighting. Because that's what it really boils down to in some of the probate cases. You, you have, it's all about the money. It's not even really about the house. It's about who's getting the money. And so when you have people that are looking to preserve their assets or make sure their children get it so they don't scramble and fight. Um, and I wrote some notes down about it, like ladybird deeds and life estate deeds. You know, people make, you know, baby boomers back in the 70s, they bought loads of real estate. And now in this generation, you're looking at IRAs, Roths, all of those different functions. And actually the bank accounts, the Roths, they can all fall under the probate category. Um, and so transitioning to that, if you have people named as designated beneficiaries on your IRA, your Roth, your bank, uh, bank account, that will alleviate any kind of probate proceeding, any court proceeding. So if you die, your kids don't have to go through it, right? And actually what's cool about that, when you go to a bank, they call it payable on death beneficiary. So you just need to hand a death certificate over. That, that beneficiary supersedes any will. Right, so you can have a will, but that is gonna matter more. But now transition to real estate, 
You want to preserve your real estate, make sure uh, your son, your daughter get it upon death. You have Lady Bird and life estate deeds. Um, and, and they're two different functions, right? So uh, Greg, you own 10 different pieces of property. You don't know anything about LLC, so you just own it in your own name. And you're like, I don't want my kids going through that. So the first thing you're thinking is, how do I avoid it? You can do a trust, we'll talk about it. But let's say you know the Lady Bird deed, the life estate deed. And you have to be careful which one you do. Because a Lady Bird deed, you can always revoke it and switch who you want a beneficiary to be. But a life estate deed locks you in. And you have to be careful with how it's drafted. You can put it and drop it into a will. Um, but we have cases at the law firm where if it's not properly drafted, it could be three years in litigation. We're already, we, we jumped in on a probate a year and a half later. The lawyer had no idea what they were working on. We started setting it for hearings. And the, the operative issue was the life estate. So the guy that was preparing it for his children wanted to make sure that nobody went through any issues. They didn't draft it properly. So mm -hmm. while people are thinking about this Lady Bird deed, life estate deed, it has to be properly drafted. And uh, you have to be careful with it because of title insurance, you know, right execution. Uh, you can't just do it on your own. Otherwise, there could be problems. So thinking about functions like that, I even wrote down like different titling deeds a certain way. So, you, you know, you're starting to think, I want to make sure my legacy is protected without you going through administrations, you going through wills. How do we change the titles to deeds or mm -hmm. bank accounts, right? Or IRAs. If you put two people on a bank account and it's jointly held, one person dies, the other still has access, so you don't need to go through a court probate proceeding. Same thing like deeds. It's all, see, probate's all about title. It's all about chain of title and title. And if somebody's named to get it, they get it. But mm -hmm. if nobody's named, now you're looking at this long drawn out proceeding. And so deeds are title. Mm -hmm. So they play a role. If you title property in a certain way, and let's just, here's a great example. Al, Greg, and Pablo. And we title it as joint, the deed, as joint tenants with the rights of survivorship. And Greg, you're looking at me and Pablo going, oh, I want you guys to get the property. If I die, I want to make sure you get it. I'm, I'm not doing any trust. Well, the function of it is a survival of the fittest deed. So whoever lives the longest gets it. So if Pablo goes, I go, you get it back, Greg. If Pablo, you go, I get it. So it's, it's almost like you avoid a court proceeding by virtue of titling it a certain way with certain language. And people mess that up. I came across two different scenarios over COVID um, and we'll switch into this about husband and wife. People are, uh, people think that if you just have the husband on the deed and the wife's alive, husband dies, uh, wife gets it. Well, she probably does, but not without some kind of court proceeding to transfer it over because title's not also in her name. So mm -hmm. anybody watching right now that's thinking first and foremost, you know, how do we protect ourselves and protect what our assets are, not even worried about probate, check the deeds, right? Because if you and your spouse are both on the deed, you need to make sure not only it says both of your names, but it says husband and wife or joint tenant or uh, tenants by the entirety because one or the other can cause an issue. And there's so many issues with uh, the way that probate happens where if one dies and the other survives and there's children, you have homestead issues Yeah, and, and it causes a mess. There's, there's so much good stuff there. And you know, I, I'm a simple guy, especially when it comes to legal matters. I, I try to keep it simple. So let me kind of run this back to you as I've, thought about probate and wills and planning a large portfolio. And I think this will resonate with some of our, our audience. And, and just let me know if, if I'm kind of simplifying it, right? So for a real estate uh, investor, let's say myself, right? I've got hundreds of rental properties, right? I've spent so much time building up this rental property portfolio, right? For our audience, right? You might have three properties, 10 properties, spent so much time, spent so much effort building out this portfolio that by taking simple actions now, creating a will, 
you can avoid probate. Probate is that costly thing that everybody has the opportunity to avoid if you take some action steps now. And it's not that hard, right? You have to have some forethought and spend a little bit of money to do it. But if you do that and you plan to pass on your assets to that further, further generation, um, you, it's, it's, it's a better, it's clearly is the best thing for your family, right? Yeah, so if you're yeah. thinking about building a large portfolio and you're thinking that this is something that's going to survive past yourself, it's a responsibility that you have the opportunity to handle today for your, to save lots and lots of hassle for other folks. And then from a cost perspective, right? I mean, the cost of probate is, is, is unnecessary, right? So is that, is that the right way to think about it? It, it is. And I think people, 95% of people don't have estate plans. I mean, that number is just always out there. Like they don't, they think about it, but then they put it off, right? They throw it under the mat um, for another day. Um, and actually, so wills don't avoid probate. Trusts do, but I had this in a seminar yesterday, properly drafted trusts avoid any court administration. Clarity is so important and not rushing to have these documents drafted. Yes, LegalZoom is out there, right? But what we say in the law firm is we love LegalZoom because it causes so much ambiguity and ambiguity breeds litigation. Mm -hmm. So then we're kind of jumping in, not what people are hoping for, but um, yet yeah, you're right, Greg, this, it, you need to think about these things now and think about, okay, I own a whole portfolio. Well, if all of them are in an LLC and you have that much of uh, real estate, I mean, why not just do some kind of trust, drop all of the LLCs into trust and you kind of protect yourself more. You get better, the better tax benefits, you get a better creditor protection. Um, you just get better things as a whole. And so revocable trust play a huge role in a lot of people that own real estate. Let me, um, let me chime in here and Greg, stop me if I'm going too basic, right? Because um, it's not my friend that's asking, it's me that knows nothing. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> just, just in case that was, uh, that was the, uh, the, the question here. Is there a moment? So if I am a first time investor at JWB, I'm about to, I, I would love to take this from the perspective of I'm about to invest with JWB. Um, and I would love to hear either from Greg and Al uh, or Al first, um, what, do I need to think about this stuff before purchasing this property or do I need to think about this stuff once it's under contract, once it's there, right? Because I hear a lot of questions like, should I start with an LLC? Does that, does that play into this? You know, I'll kind of, I'll kind of jump in there. Um, this isn't something you have to have figured out immediately, right? It's not something you have to have figured out before you start to put the property under contract, right? Um, there are some things that you really kind of need to understand at a high level. Uh, but, but some of the things that are going to protect you the most, like an LLC are going to make it harder for you to acquire the property or harder to get financing. So it's not a, it's not something that you have to do immediately, right? It's more of a comprehensive plan with an expert like Al and with our team and with the experts that we have on the financing side and on the insurance side. And it's, and that's not a one size fits all plan for everybody. It's based on, you know, your level of uh, risk that you are willing to take on as well. So um, it's a, it's kind of a team approach and it's something that we work through during the time that we onboard a client, when we build the buying plan with the client, when we close on the client, uh, on the properties with the client, that's one necessary step. And then that, that might be when we take that next step to get somebody like Al um, involved and, and setting up that asset protection the way we want. Um, or for other clients, we may decide that that's not necessary today. That might be a necessary thing when they reach three properties or 10 properties. So the, I think the biggest answer is uh, it's a comprehensive effort and um, you have to be one phone call away from experts on all sides of it to put the right plan together for you. I agree with Greg. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think that it's not something that everyone's going to do up front or later on in life, or maybe they never do it at all. It, it can't stop you from buying real estate. It can't stop you from doing the things that are going to have passive income for you. You, you. you learn it. You go as 
go with the flow, right? And so you can buy the real estate, then you can eventually quit claim it into your LLC. You can eventually do a trust or a revocable trust. And what ends up happening is somebody just may buy the real estate. They never thought about any of this estate planning stuff, the trust stuff. Then they're going to a little house party during Christmas, Thanksgiving, whatever it is. And somebody's mentioning it and they never thought about that before. The light bulb goes on and they're like, wait a second, we own all this property. We maintain all of this personal liability too with it being in our name. And if we have tenants in that property and somebody you know, slips, falls and sues and they have a collectible position against all our property, we're thinking, wait a second, we don't want that to happen. So we're going to start doing LLCs. And people are not thinking about that right away, Pablo. We, I had somebody call me about a year ago. I remember this because of that question. She said, I'm about to purchase real estate. Should I wait to do the LLC uh, at, uh, before or should I just buy the real estate and then quit claim it? And I was like, you got to live your life and, and, and make the deal happen. So um, everybody's different. Everybody's just got the different knowledge base whenever you get to it. We have clients in the law firm that never take care of this stuff until they're 95. I've seen it. And, 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 and they do it. They, they want to get it done and it helps protect them. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. So I'm, am I hearing as long as you handle this stuff before you pass away, you're good, <laughs> right? Kind of, right? <laughs> kind of, right? The yeah. asterisk. Yeah. Um, you, because where I'm kind of going with it is that properly drafted items can avoid court administration. So here's a really good example. There was a really well-known uh, drafting estate planning lawyer in town, mm -hmm. and uh, I made note of it too. And we ended up getting the case to do the trust administration. Something was messed up. Uh, the kids had a load of money, trust fund babies. They're about to get like, you know, $15 million. I mean, a lot of money. And there was an issue with the stock market accounts or the, I forgot it was what, what company it was, and they wouldn't release the money to them. And the reason was, is that they were looking at a specific provision in the trust uh, about distributions and it was missing. And there was a huge paragraph about directing what the company can do for distributions. And so the kids were like, what? Like, we can't believe it. We're talking about an estate planning lawyer that practiced law for 35 years, probably did his own trust, like doing own, your own surgery on yourself. And he created the trust. He got it executed, notarized. And, and now we're in a trust administration issue. So now they're hiring us and we have to go in and fix it. So yes, it, if you do all this stuff, sure. It protects you a lot, except for things that aren't considered, people that aren't named, successor trustees that are not named, personal representatives, things that you don't consider. I mean, people don't consider simple things like healthcare surrogates. And if something, somebody goes incompetent, we're power of attorneys. Somebody goes incompetent, they have all of this real estate. I mean, all of it, all the companies and, and nobody's named to help manage it. Now you're talking about a huge proceeding in court called guardianship, and those are expensive. I mean, they're not like $2,500 or $3,000 a pop. Those are really expensive, and, and people don't think about that. You know, you may be 45, and it's just it's a wrongful death case, um, and you have, you have 15 pieces of property people are not thinking about. So, yeah, it protects you, but there's also documents that are not properly drafted that can – pose issues, just like deeds. If deeds aren't titled right, if it, if it just says A and B, and there's no special magic language, the whole thing can be shot. Um, we, we have that right now in Broward. So, I mean, the, the whole issue is title. Title and drafting is very important. And I'll, you know, Pablo, your question is great because it gives, it, it helps everybody understand kind of what's really necessary right now. I love Val's answer that you know, at, at some point we have to live our lives. And when it comes to the real estate transaction, right, the legal part of this should never stand in the way of acquiring an asset that is a, that, that's right for you, right? Um, and I was just going to share my personal story. You know, when I started, I was 23 years old with my business partners. We were not thinking about asset protection when we started, <laughs> right? We bought about 40 rental properties in the first year and a half. I don't think I ever said the words asset protection, <laughs> right? Um, and we bought those in our personal names. Now we learned about asset protection in the coming years, 
uh, I still decided to keep those in my personal name for a period of time because I was comfortable with the risk and I had the insurance and that can be a strategy for some folks out there, right? Some may decide to put in the LLC. But what I have learned over the years is that this conversation is one that I need to have on an annual basis. So I don't know if anybody else out there has sort of their annual conversations that they have, right? It might be with your CPA, it's with your, you know, you go and you get your health care, right? Your, your checkup once a year, right? Um, your financial advisor, if you have one, right? Whatever those is, this type of asset planning conversation for me is now an annual conversation that we have. We start to plan it out. We review what we did in the previous years. We see if anything has changed. And that's, that's the importance of having a teammate like Al there, one phone call away. That's really what you're eventually going to evolve into. For sure. And I appreciate that, Greg, because, you know, we see so many, we have clients that will come in basically every year, right? We'll have ones that change their estate plan probably three times a year. And we're looking at the calendar thinking, you know, is this another change? Is this a codicil to the will? Like, what's the change now? And it's just because there are those types of people out there that think about this all the time. And, you know, we, we live lives. So we're not going to think about, you know, death. We're not thinking about, you know, if we lose our faculties in our brain, we're just not there. And, but knowing these tools in advance can help prompt uh, what you do and watching other people's mistakes is more important than going through your own mistake. Cause you can learn what happened to them and think, Oh, I don't want, I saw Sally go through that. I don't want to go through that. Um, so very important to think of uh, LLCs and um, something else people don't think about in the terms of uh, protection and, and uh, estate planning is the very a law that we have here in Florida, which is beautiful. It's the homestead law and, you know, protect creditor protection. Um, it helps protect spouses and minors in, in devices of homestead. Um, and it protects against creditors, even during a probate situation. Help, you know, when you purchase a home, um, I heard about this story when I was working in Miami, they, they were like, if you buy a home, you want to buy a home in unincorporated because then you get more than a half acre of homestead protection. And I was like, what, what is that? So I learned that if you live in a municipality and your property is 0.5 acres or under, you have the full Florida creditor a homestead protection. Huge estate plan on its own, right? Because you're smart about what size property you purchase. That way you protect your family from any creditors that are going to try to force that sale of that house. But if you live, if you buy a property that's outside, so in the middle of 32221, right out in the middle of nowhere, it could be unincorporated. And now you can buy up to 160 acres of land that could be homestead protected. So knowing simple things like how we have a beautiful law with homestead alone helps you know, people think about preparing for these things next time you buy a house. You, know, you always hear about the tax exemptions that you get in the save our homes and saving money on taxes, but um, so many different avenues with estate planning. Excellent. Excellent. That's good. That's good stuff, man. So we're getting a lot, we're starting to get some really good questions here. Right. And I, I empathize with number one, uh, Peter Adebi says, based on my question, I get this right. He goes, problem is you don't know when you're going to pass away. So the sooner the better. Totally, totally agree. I just, I wanted to pose that question out there like that to see what you guys would say. Cause I thought it would come to a good conversation. And then Roger Evans also puts this information is all great, but the legal part sometimes gets very confusing to know exactly what needs to be done. And that's why we're having these conversations, right? Like, like Al said, you learn a lot from the, from the experiences of others in this world. And, you know, to me, it's obvious that's the, that's the value of bringing on a guy like you, Al, is that you've had these experiences at scale through the service that you provide, but we're getting some questions about cost, right? And I want to, and I want to start right now with Lee Bishop. It's a pretty specific one, but he says, from what I understand, uh, maybe I can clarify this. Probate means you as the inheritor has to pay tax on the portfolio and the percentage differs from state to state or even counties. Is that accurate? Um, well, in terms of probate, uh, what really it is in terms of the probate world is just transferring title. And sometimes you don't even need to deal with the full administration of all of the tax stuff and all of the probate stuff. But like the, all you're doing is just transferring title 
very rarely are you having estates that are like more than 75,000 or you'll have estates that are like the federal tax uh, stuff like the five point, I don't even know what it is right now, like 5.38. Um, I think Greg's nodding his head. So, uh, but in terms of the probate world and what I do, what we're just trying to do in is, is administer what the deceased had, trying to transfer all title over, close it out, get the debts. You don't have to necessarily satisfy the debts. So in probate, certain debts stick of the deceased and certain ones don't. So mortgages, roofing liens, all of that stuff, they may have the rights to try to get their collected money back. But credit card debts, uh, Comcast, Home Depot, those people, we will just file objections to it, make, force them to make their claims, and they never do. It's too small. It's not enough money to litigate, you know, $25 on an invoice. But um, all we're doing is just administering the estate. That's it. Okay. So and let, let me try to understand the cost perspective a little bit more, because I think that was, that was a lot of the question, and I, I really don't know. I've never been through probate, so. <laughs> um, so, it, and maybe I just don't understand it fully, but in my mind, right, probate is the, you know, the, the changing of the title, but it, it's, if you don't direct what is going to happen, then the state directs that for you. And I, I, my understanding is that's done through the probate process. And then I would imagine the costs are the, the, and maybe there's some state costs, but I would think it's the legal fees that go along with kind of the state administering that. So you're, you're paying a lot of legal fees for a much more complicated process to go through probate versus if you have your will and your trust set up correctly, then it is minimal legal fees. It's just following the path. Is, is, that, is that accurate? There's so many ways the question can go too, because each person has a different amount of assets, right? Sometimes, usually what I run across, it's one house, it's homestead, we transfer it over, we're done. And then we're talking about like even attorney's fees, we'll do flat fees for that, right? But sometimes we run into probates where it's 100,000, 150, 200, and we have costs that we have to incur to administer the estate. And it could be, depending on the value of the estate, what we charge for fees could be 3%. So in terms of attorney's fees, it all depends on the value, how much work's involved and that stuff. Um, in terms of the debt, we kind of covered that part, but there's so many, again, in Florida, people really just have a house, some bank accounts, and that's it. That's it. With probate. Not these listeners, Al. These <laughs> listeners have 10, 20, 50 properties. Well, then you're talking about making sure you have trust in play. Because then you want to make sure once you have a trust, you deed then your property into the trust. And therefore, once you die, you've already now have a trust document that's going to name who is overseeing and who's responsible then for paying those costs, who has to pay the taxes, utilities, the insurance. You then are directing people to pay that stuff to make sure you preserve the estate. Trustees have duties in Florida. One of them is to make sure you invest prudently and uh, you look after the estate. And if you don't, you can be removed by a beneficiary on trust. All right. Well, I'm going to ask this question here by Guillermo Montes. And I feel like, I, I feel insecure asking this because it sounds like your answer is going to be, you don't know, it depends, right? But like, I, I'm, I'm going to put it out there. Guillermo Montes asks, let's say you have a $500,000 portfolio of properties, bank account, bank accounts and you did no planning, what is the cost to go through a probate in terms of money and time? Wow, that's probably going to run under the 3% rule in Florida um, because it's, it's structured about how much, how much assets there are. Homestead counts as zero. Everything after that counts as an asset. So it, it all depends. If nothing is titled, everything's titled in your name and nothing's going to a trust or anything, how long? It varies by county, um, you, could be, you could be looking at six to 12 months. It depends with creditors, uh, with, with anybody that's fighting back, maybe fighting beneficiaries. Um, it, the length of time of probate changes when the value gets to big numbers. It just changes. 
from a cost perspective is that three percent on the uh on the asset value so that would be what uh fifteen thousand dollars there yeah it could be fifteen thousand dollars or whatever you arrange with the lawyer i mean the fifteen thousand could be like the base mm -hmm. of like what it would expect it to be but it always depends on you know is there contested litigation is anybody trying to come back and say they have a right to it okay and if I may step out on this limb, what do you think it would cost to upfront protect that stuff so you didn't have to go through probate on the back end? Is that a is that a difference in like price cost or is that just a difference in like I just want to make sure my kids get this thing? You know, trusts are different. Um, it, it depends on how many things are going in the trust. You could be looking at three thousand. You could be looking at five thousand. But yeah you are actually doing yourself a favor by doing a trust up front. We tell people, you either pay a lot up front or you pay a lot at the end. And so by doing a trust up front, you save so much time, including all of the assets and titling them in a trust. Therefore, upon death, everything goes into the trustee who is now on title for everything to manage, to disperse, to pay, to distribute, any of that stuff. So Actually, we tell people it'd be great if you do a trust, especially with that kind of money. We don't really deal with a lot of people that have that kind of money, but when we do, it's an automatic, we're thinking trust. I trust that answer. All right, so <laughs> John Aklagi uh, asked a couple questions here, and, and, and he directed this first one at UL. I'm not sure if it's, if it's a better for, for Greg to answer, but he says, uh, Mr. Nicoletti, I have heard that banks are more eager to lend to you when the property is in your name. If that is true, should I keep it in my own name or if I don't have many properties or any children? Greg, you I'll leave that one for you. Yeah, I'll take that one. So, I mean, you know how I shared that when I started at 23, I bought my first 40 rental properties, kept them in my personal name. That was the big reason why I did that. It's because from a financing perspective, you can't get financing in the name of an LLC or you can't do it inexpensively. It's always more advantageous to go the conventional financing route. And that was more uh, important to me in, ass in growing my assets when I was really young, to be able to use financing, to be able to build those assets. Um, and that's, you know, of course, what we've continued to do along the way. Uh, now, there are ways to do that, be able to buy it in your personal name. And then, of course, with a proper plan to be able to transfer those assets into an LLC later on, right? There are, there's, there, it's not a, you, know, you need to understand exactly how you do it. It's not as simple as many might think. There's the right way to do it. Um, but, but that's really kind of the comprehensive plan. That's really what, what ultimately I did for my own personal uh, rental property portfolio. Now, of course, it's in an LLC because we got a lot of those in there and um, it's different than when I was 23 because I've got a family now. So, you know, but that's kind of the natural evolution. All right. And just a, another one from him is, and I'm sure you can answer this quickly. Sh is it correct? He heard that it's correct that you should meet with your CPA every 90 days. Is that, is that about accurate? We meet with our CPA like weekly. <laughs> if, you, CPA. if you were John, if you were John, would it be a 90 day thing? It, yeah. That's just to show you that it depends on where you're at. Right. Yeah. When I, when I first started at 23, I think I met with my CPA once a year. Um, and I, I remember in the beginning, I was in control of our accounting at JWB and I would have like this big, like folder. It was twice as big as this. And I would staple all my receipts. And I remember I would go in with this big folder into my CPA's office and I'd say, all right, I'm prepared. Here you go. And oh, it was just a train wreck. So, uh, he was not looking forward to my meeting once a year. I can tell you, or probably he was, cause I got charged a lot, um, uh, from doing that. So, uh, you know, when you're first starting out, I'd say once a year is, it's probably a good thing to do. If you meet more, you know, you, it depends on your activity and your level of assets, really. Um, eventually you'll work up as your assets get more plentiful, as your activity gets more plentiful and, and your CPA will be somebody that is just kind of in lockstep with you uh, because they are one of the biggest driver of your overall net returns for your activity, right? After taxes is what we're all looking for. Um, so it'll be somewhere in between. Makes sense. Uh making a note here to meet with my CPA. Uh, so th th there's also, a, <laughs> right? yeah, there's also <laughs> we even have it in the retainer agreements that we have that says CPA advice. And it says, we are not CPA. So make sure you consult with CPA because we're out. <laughs> yeah. Um, 
Another one, Al, that, that isn't specific, isn't really to you, but um, ours main asked this early on. I just want to get it out of the way so we can get more into the, the you know, your, your expertise. Greg, ours main, and I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing this correctly, asked, how restricted are we as owners to evict due to unpaid rentals right now? How restricted are we as owners to evict? Well, right now there is a moratorium on evictions um, through the end of the year. Now, the big difference now versus what the various moratoriums we had earlier on was those earlier moratoriums said that nobody could be evicted due to non-payment of rent. Um, now the burden has shifted to where people need to prove or to show that they have been financially affected or in some other way affected by COVID. And that burden is actually on the resident. Um, so that, that's a, a, an important shift. The, the thing about it now is nobody really knows how this is going to play out in the eviction court, because at the end of the day, it, it depends on a judge's ruling. And um, so it's a little bit of uncharted territory right now. Evictions are going through that necessary process. It's one of the things I'm interested in, in sharing with you all as far as how that goes, because we don't really know where that is going to end up uh, based on what judges are feeling and deciding with the current state of state of things. So um, we are not actually seeing a lot of evictions go through for non-payment as I stand here today or sit here with you today, but the process is starting to happen and we'll just kind of have to see how it shakes out. Okay. I, out of sheer curiosity, Al, has COVID affected the probate process in any way? Are you, are you dealing with any specific, like, have you had a case that has to do with a COVID thing that adds a little niche to this whole thing? I'll say this, Pablo. Probate is recession proof, it's depression proof, and now it's pandemic proof, right? <laughs> so it has, it has not stopped. The courts have not been closed. Physically, we haven't been able to walk in. But all on the computer, all electronically, it doesn't matter. I've been doing ones. I did one in Miami in April, in the middle of the pandemic, and we got the court order. So no, it, it has been beautiful. I've, I've had more cases than ever this year. I think if there was no pandemic, it would have been even more, but it hasn't slowed down. It actually was something that was keeping the law firm just keep going during the pandemic because nobody was driving, so no personal injury accidents. Uh, nobody was really doing anything, so nobody could do estate planning. Nobody wanted to uh, go anywhere. When we had our first estate planning client, I mean, we were all like spread out at all corners of the room, uh, but the probate stuff of just properties, assets has been great. And uh, just to follow up on the uh, eviction thing that Greg was kind of talking about, we actually had a quiet title tax deed over uh, April or May and the whole moratorium had hit. And so we couldn't do anything. And at least I got my final judgment from the court that said, yep, yeah, the tax deed, you know, we're, we're looking at, it's a valid deed. Um, and then we applied for a writ of possession. And I think this was, was like May 4th. And I got the writ from the cl uh, clerk and we were all like, what is going on? And so the next thing you know is we sent everything down to the sheriff. Uh, a month later, I think it was the June executive order from DeSantis that said it, you were allowing more things to happen. The investor calls me, he goes, the sheriff's going, we're kicking the lady out. So we were starting to get people out of the homes, not just on evictions, but the tax deed quiet titles back in June. I just had one now on an unlawful detainer, the squatter, you know, squatters, no right, no title, no license, nothing. And uh, we got them served. We got them, we got a, a writ. And now they called the sheriff and the sheriff said, hey, we're going to meet you there next uh, week. So yeah, certain things are moving. The non-payment thing is just, I mean, it is what it is. It's, you know, Greg seeing it more on his end with the portfolio. So there's, there's more data coming out from Greg's side, but on the weirder things like the squatters i mean they're kicking people out i mean the sheriffs are going now and doing it so no my business has not slowed down it's been beautiful all right so no little extra externality of the not your average investor show if you have a, a young kid that's practicing law and wants a recession proof uh, career probate <laughs> probate yeah 
pandemic proof and what else is asteroid proof next yeah. <laughs> asteroid. all right let's go we, we got some good we got some good deep stuff here to, that i'm going to try to knock out in our last 50 minutes here uh zach correa asks from a retirement planning perspective are real estate privacy trusts a smarter choice than an llc speaking llcs is a series llc better than a traditional llc is insurance really considered asset protection Maybe a start, but in itself, not really an anonymity asset protection, right? Did you keep, did you catch all that out? Uh, you know, I, I, the only thing I was thinking was LLCs are great for asset protection. Mm -hmm. If you have two or more members, um, make sure you, you're not a solo membership LLC because courts look at it as like, are you a shell company? You know, are you just trying to look like you want to protect yourself from creditors? So if you ever do an LLC, make sure it's two or more. Not sure too much on the traditional and the other name. Greg probably knows more about that. Uh, but doing those kinds of things, the, those steps of LLCs and titling your properties in LLCs is a major benefit. I even was learning in Miami that sometimes it's good to do an LLC for each property, like a different LLC for each property. Talk about insurance. I mean, insurance can be something that you pay for and never use it. But LLCs are like insurance, right? You're protecting yourself from creditors. If there's ever a lawsuit, they can't collect. Um, so I hope that kind of answered the question. LLCs are great. And, uh, you can always put your LLCs into a trust. You can do so many different things in the estate planning world. And I'll, I'll kind of chime in on the trust side because as a real estate guy, and I know Zach is as well, we, we hear about trusts a lot, privacy trusts. Um, and the, the benefit that we hear of is the anonymity from the privacy trust and, and feel free if I'm, if I'm not saying this correctly, Al, but you know, a trust gives you that anonymity. I don't believe it gives you the asset protection. LLCs give you the asset protection. And of course, depending on how you title it and anonymity, I would imagine as well. Um, and from a financing perspective, you've run into issues with both. So if you if you want to get conventional financing, you, you can't do it in the name of a trust or an LLC. Um, and then insurance is a little bit of a challenge as on the, either from a cost perspective or in the, in the name of the trust, it's, it's a, thanks, uh, insurance companies don't typically understand it, um, has been my experience. So Al, I threw a lot out there, pick apart. Was I, was I right on most of that stuff? Yeah, I think trust can be a really good uh, asset protection as well. I mean, you have to pierce through the trust now. I mean, it's, it's almost in the same terms of LLC. I mean, if you do the LLC the right way with two or more members, and now you've created a company rather than an individual, trust has that same kind of function. You're not an individual anymore. You're a thing. So it's harder to pierce through it. And there are more assets in the trust that if they get through the trust, then you have everything. That's why I kind of like the LLCs. If you do a different, different name for a different property or you just do a whole portfolio and keep it under one uh, umbrella that works too. Um, I, I just, I don't think there's any best way. Nothing is creditor proof. Anything can be penetrated for terms of litigation. So if anybody really got a final judgment and they wanted to, you know, do your deposition in native execution, they're going to grow you. They're going to grow the trustee. They're going to grow the individual and they're going to find out where the assets are. Rarely does that ever happen. No. But nothing's creditor proof. If they really wanted to try to go undo it or undo the trust, they could try. I mean, there's, there's laws in Florida about um, if you're in litigation, it's called proceeding supplementary. If you're in litigation now and you then redo your title, your property and deed it out to somebody or redo it into a trust or an LLC and they sue for the matter and they try to collect if they can try to allege that that was a fraudulent transfer. So there's a period of time in Florida of when you can do something like that if you're being sued. So you have to be careful about when you do your asset protection because it could be all undone if you're trying to fraudulently do it. Oh, we see so many things, Greg. Um, we saw- You're scaring the hell out of me. I, I mean, how do you wake up every morning and not just freak yourself out, man? I mean, goodness, all the things that you see that people get, you know, that are not advantageous that uh, that happens because of things that who would think of that, right? 
Yeah. I'm definitely driving more in the right lane on the freeway <laughs> than the left lane, you know, now, yeah. uh, cause you just see so many different things. You're, you, you gotta be careful with it. Like Miami has so many, there's more cases even down there, more, uh, uh, district courts of appeal cases than ever. So a lot of law in Florida comes out of that district down there and you see a lot of the fraudulent transfers, the bankruptcy things down there. So crazy. Well, and you know, and all of this information is incredibly helpful. I, you know, I'll kind of just give again what what I have done throughout the years, right? I've I've really weighed what my risk level is with my return on my investment, right? So, right, if we and putting in a, every property in an LLC might be the right play for somebody, right? If that's if you are somebody who really wants to make sure that you are as protected as you possibly can be, and you put that as a higher priority, then that might be the right thing for you, right? Now, what you're giving up is some of the return on investment, right? If you do that from day one, you might, you're, you're not gonna be able to get the same financing terms that you could get, right? Insurance is gonna cost more than if you insured it in your personal name, right? There's gonna be costs of an LLC that you have you know, every year, right? There, there's just, and, and there's other things that you have to do to maintain the LLCs. Um, and so for me, my personal view when I was 23 is that I, I wanted to focus on more of the asset building and then to weave in, of course, the asset protection over time. And uh, neither is right or wrong, but it, I think it's something, and this is something, of course, that Zach will help you with. I know you're a current client, right? For all the folks that we bring on board, this is a part of the discussion with you and it's a part of the long-term planning that it's, it's not a one size fits all. We need to understand why it's important for you to do what you're doing and what, what is the cost of it, right? Is, are you giving up some protection from risk? Are you giving up some of your return? Which is the right thing for you? That's kind of why, you, you know, this is a starting point for a lot of you to think about these things. This isn't the end point because there's too much that goes into the decision. Even having this conversation, Greg, is, and people paying attention on the comments and watching us right now, this conversation alone may be the light bulb to help them think we really need to take care of some of these things. We need to go back to the drawing board, reevaluate our estate plan, reevaluate our portfolio situation. And um, yeah, it, it's crazy. Yeah, and I want to I want to say something that Denny Davis Denny Davies here said uh, he didn't. Uh, change it to all panelists and attendees, so it only came to us. But he, you know, we're not here to freak anybody out, right? Like these are the, these are what ifs that are scary, uh, and they rarely happen. But it's just it's something to, it's something to put out there. We have very little time left. I'm just gonna handpick a couple questions here that I think are, are going to be extra valuable. And by the way, Al Mar Margaret Smith says, bring Al back next week. This info is very important to us all. So you you already have. Uh, repeated requests and there we go all right greg and pablo you'll have me on next week for probate and more right tbd we you may get a regular segment here but i would listen yeah. margaret i would recommend that you join our facebook group go to jwb facebookgroup.com and join our facebook group al's in there right like become friends with al online he's uh he's very available on facebook and and we may we may bring him back i'm not opposed to it we'll we'll, we'll talk about that later think um, long and hard yeah, yeah. <laughs> jackie hung has a question is there any advantage to have living trust recorded in different in a different state, like adding a bit of difficulty in the public record for anonymity? Well, in terms of a land trust, you don't want a land trust to be recorded in the county. The purpose of a land trust is to create anonymity. And the only thing you're doing in a land trust is recording the trustee's deed. And the trustee shouldn't be any of the beneficiaries because that's, there's a whole side to land trust that you don't want to record a trust. Really, you don't even record revocable living trust. Out of state, I don't know what those laws are like. I don't know what happens there. But in my world, anything that gets recorded is public record. And now you've just totally breached anonymity, period. So I don't recommend necessarily uh, having something recorded if it doesn't have to be. Like mortgages, they get recorded. Notes are not recorded. Um, I rarely see that, but trust, no. Um, so being careful about what the jurisdiction requires, uh, they don't, you know, recommend getting trust recorded, but maybe if the statute in another state says they must be recorded, well, that's a different animal, um, in order for that trust to work. Okay. Lee Bishop asks, Al, my understanding is a revocable trust is no payment except to pay to put it together and you can add properties to it with no additional fees. Is that true? 
So what was that first part, Pablo? I, th I believe he's, he's saying that once you create a revocable trust, you've paid your money up front and you can add properties with no additional fees. Is that true? It depends on who's doing the estate plan, right? So it depends on how much more work there is. Um, maybe if it's just a tweak, you're adding a person on as a beneficiary, you're adding maybe, you're, you're, you change the name of the LLC, you know, but now when you start adding more portfolios and, you're, and you wanna do more deeds and maybe it now starts going beyond the federal tax uh, exemption, now you gotta fill out more uh, tax forms. I don't know anything about the tax forms, uh, but you, you, you gotta get more into um, uh, adding documents, doing amendments to trust. Um, th those are, they can take time. Um, and you want it to be done right as well, properly drafted. We see ones in the law firm where he, we, we did it. The uh, firm did it back in the 90s. And all of a sudden now they're redoing it again in uh, 2017. And then they did it again in 2020. And it's like completely different, right? So 20, 30 years ago, uh, now they need something different. Okay. And we are, we're winding down here. I'm going to go rapid fire. Ready? Roger Evans asks, I understand that when you transfer properties into an LLC, the bank could possibly call in the loan to be paid off. Is that correct? It's possible. Okay. That's good rapid fire answer. Um, <laughs> John Aklagi asks, Mr. Nicoletti, are trusts only beneficial for high income earners for either, you know, are they only beneficial for high income, income earners and does it make a difference if they're active investors or passive investors? It really doesn't matter either way. I mean, it, it's better if you have, if the more income you have, the more money you have, the better it is to do a trust. But we have plenty of people that if they just want to put their property in a trust and a couple of things, uh, a couple of bank accounts, maybe they're 10, 20,000, they'll do that too. It's all preference about how much money you want to spend at the end of the day. Technically still rapid fire answer. Guillermo Montes asks, how about using a land trust or called real estate privacy trust for each property or for a number of properties? I know many people that are doing land trusts. Um, I like the LLCs though better because you can actually get the tax benefits, the write-offs on the LLCs. And yeah, you do get the anonymity. Um, you, you, can, you can figure out a way to do your assignments and your beneficiary transfers and stuff. Um, I know plenty of investors that like it. Greg, I don't know if, if you like- We started. Do. Yeah, I'll just chime in with personal experience. We started doing that. Uh, we started with our- you know, properties in the beginning, we would buy them, we would get the financing, we then put it into land trust. It created a huge web of work. And we had to re-explain this, especially on the insurance side. It got to the point where it wasn't worth it for us, uh, you know, protected ourselves with adequate insurance, kept the properties in our personal name for a while. So there's nothing wrong with it. And, and from my perspective, and from a non-legal perspective, you know, privacy trust can be a good thing for anonymity. But from a, like a real perspective too, there's a hell of a lot of extra stuff that you have to do to maintain it. And it just got to be too much for us. All right, that's it. We, uh, we're right at, we're right at 1.30. Uh, great questions from everybody. We have a couple left over. You know, I advise, join the, join the Facebook group, ask in the Facebook group. Um, this was an awesome call. Thank, we've had over 40 people on with us this whole time. Super, super, super grateful for anybody that takes out an hour of the time to spend with Greg and I and Al and, 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 and the rest of us here on a Tuesday. Really appreciate it. Highly recommend you join us on Thursdays where we do the JWB rental income property of the week. Week, week, week. week. <laughs> <laughs> and we, and we break down, we break down a property. We go through the numbers. It's much more like um, tactical rental income property advice, right? Like this was a very specific topic that I can tell we got a lot of value out of. Um, and, uh, and again, if you're looking for more information, go to jwbwebclass.com, get the free investor toolkit. If you're going to join us on Thursday, I suggest you do it so that you have your own spreadsheet that you can follow along that we manipulate on the show. Uh, and it can be an interactive experience. Al, what can I say, buddy? You killed it, right? Like you, uh, you totally, you know, you met my expectations, which was super high because I know you're a beast at this. And uh, this was really, really fun. I learned a lot. My friend that didn't know anything about probate now knows a bunch about probate soon when I tell him or her, whoever that may be. And, um, you know, really appreciate it. And Greg, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll give it up to you for, for, Oh, you know what? Al, we didn't, we didn't give a chance for you to tell people how to find you, man. Yeah. The best way to find me is I have a phone number. It's the 904-246-9994. Um, you can reach me at, me at my email. I probably should just put that in the comment boxes. It's going to be like a whole spelling 
of the, uh, and then of course, find me on my YouTube channel. I've got a YouTube channel, I do videos every Friday that get posted. So different videos, different topics, find me on there, add me and find me on Facebook. It's at Al Nicoletti. That's the best way you can message me questions, uh, schedule consults, whatever works for you. And, uh, you know, while I got the floor real quick, Greg, Pablo, Thank you so much for having me here. I mean, this is my first time really talking with Greg, you know, meeting Greg on Zoom and uh, love hearing what his advice is and his experience. I mean, you've been doing it for such a long time, Greg. So love being on this show. Pablo, you are incredible as always, opening it up, warming uh, and closing it out. So again, would love to be back. I love the show and I hope everybody got a lot of information. Al, I, I've never heard uh, a lawyer be so effusive in praise, so so just genuinely nice, and then also mention the words Facebook and YouTube. I didn't think that was in a lawyer's vernacular there. Um, you know, <laughs> Al is, <laughs> is an incredible uh, resource for all of you, which is not normally something that we say um, when it comes to lawyers, right? I mean, nor so I'm just so thankful that you decided to uh, – to share your, your incredible knowledge, spend the time with us. I know everybody on the, on the call here really benefited and uh, would really encourage all of you to, to watch it. This is a topic that you're gonna need to think about and listen to probably multiple times to really get everything that Al was talking about and some of the things that I shared as well uh, from a real estate perspective. So um, one of the things we do is we have a watch party every Tuesday where we replay the show. We do Tuesday at 9 p.m. So would love to encourage all of you to be there. It's a really fun thing. I'm there. You know, Al, would love for you to be there too if you can fit it into your busy schedule. Um, but it's a great way to kind of um, take in the session again and then, of course, answer any questions that you have in real time. Um, so, Al, thanks again for, for being here. Really in, in, uh, have enjoyed uh, getting to talk to you, first of all, here uh, and enjoyed our relationship in the future. I appreciate it, buddy. I love it, Greg. I, I can't wait for the future and looking forward to all the business. And uh, you and Pablo are just so wonderful. And I love being on the show with you too. All right, buddy. See you all at the watch party, party, Facebook group, or what's that echo? Or, uh, or on Thursday, right? See you all soon. Bye-bye.